So Newton's laws are three laws that describe the behavior of forces. And so a force is kind of a, a push or pull between two objects. So for example, whenever two objects are touching each other, then they are exerting forces on each other. But two objects don't have to you know, actually touch in order to exert forces. For example, we know that gravity is exerted by the Earth on, on every object near the Earth, even though they might not be touching the Earth directly. So for example, here we have some blocks sitting on a table, and you can see that the force of gravity is going to be pointing down. So, well, you could ask, if the gravity is pointing down, then why doesn't the, the block just fall through the table? And well, it turns out there's a force that's pointing up also, uh, exerted by the table. And we call this the normal force. The normal force is the force that's exerted by the surface on some object that's sitting on the surface. So whenever something's like sitting on a table or on the floor, then the table or the floor is exerting a normal force on the object. And the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So you can see here, you know, the surface is horizontal, so the normal force is going to be pointing straight up. And it's directly counteracting the force of gravity. So that's why the, the block isn't falling through the table. And so another type of force is called a tension force. And this is really just a force that's exerted by a string or some object. So you know, say you have a block that's attached to a tight string, then the, the force that the string is exerting on the block, we call that tension. It's not, it's just a force. It's not really anything special. So you can see here, the, here are two blocks connected by a string. And so the string pulls on the first block and the second block with some tension force. And they might not, they're not necessarily the same. Now, in some cases they are, but not always. And so another important point is that forces are vectors. So, you know, they behave like any other vector. You know, we, can, we add them like vectors, subtract them like vectors, etc. One of the most important things that we can do with force vectors is separate them into their components. So a lot of times we want to separate them into their x and y components because that's more convenient to analyze a situation. You know, instead of working with vectors, if we can separate into x and y components, then we just get, you know, scalar equations. And so an another concept is this concept of external and internal forces. So say we, we have a system, and so any external forces are going to be exerted by objects that are outside the system. And internal forces are forces that come from inside. You know, so say we have this box filled with apples. And so what are the external forces on this box of apples? Well, say you are pushing the box of apples. So the, the force that you exert on the box is going to be one external force. And two other external forces are going to be gravity and the normal force. You know, the normal force being exerted by the floor that the box is on. We also know that all the apples bouncing around inside the box are going to exert some kind of force on the walls of the box. And, of course, they're going to exert forces on the other apples. So, but all those forces are going to be internal forces because they're inside the box. You know, they're part of the system that we're analyzing. However, if we changed our system, if we said our system was one of the apples, then the situation would change. Now the external forces on an individual apple, they include gravity, they include the force from the box, which would be the normal, normal force, and they also include all the other forces from the other apples bouncing around on it. But notice how the, the force that you are pushing on the box, that does not affect an individual apple anymore. So depending on the system, the external and internal forces change. This is important because a lot of times we only want to look at the external forces. And in particular, we may be interested in something called the net external force. So the net force is just what you get when you add up all the external forces. And again, remember to do this, we have to remember that forces are vectors. So we have to find the vector sum or separate into components and then add up all the x components 
and all the y components separately. So this brings us to Newton's first law, which says that if the net external force on an object is zero, then the object continues to move at a constant velocity. So this means if an object is at rest and there's no external net external force on it, then it stays at rest. If it's moving at a constant speed, then it, it keeps moving at that speed in a straight line. You know, it has to be a straight line because constant velocity implies that the velocity is not changing direction or magnitude. So this is this is also known as the principle of inertia and this inertia is basically an object's ability to resist resist changes in its motion. So how hard is it to get this object to you know, turn or accelerate? And inertia is quantified or measured by mass. So the more mass an object has, the more inertia it has. And so the harder it is to you know change its motion. You know, either get it to start moving or stop moving or go in a different direction. So here are some examples uh, of Newton's first law. So first we have a, a block that's still, its initial velocity is zero, and the force of gravity and the normal force on it exerted by the floor are canceling out. You know, they're counteracting each other. So the net external force on this block is zero. And the second one, again the gravity and the normal force are canceling out. But this time the block is moving at a constant speed of five meters per second. But in both situations, you know, the net external force is zero, so that means they're going to continue doing what they're doing. The first block is going to stay still, the second block is going to keep moving five meters per second in a straight line. Next we have this, this ball moving in a circle at a constant speed of five meters per second. However, even though it's moving at a constant speed, it's not moving in a straight line. To move in a circle, the velocity has to constantly be changing direction. So that means if the velocity is changing, it has some acceleration. And so that means the net fo external force on it cannot be equal to zero. If the net external force is equal to zero, it would be moving in a straight line. And so we can use Newton's first law to define something called an initial reference frame. So remember, a reference frame is kind of the setting we look at a problem in. You know, where is our perspective? on the problem. So an initial reference frame is a reference frame in which Newton's first law works. So for example, imagine you're standing in this car and the car and you are at rest. And then the car suddenly starts accelerating. So you know it picks up speed and so you're gonna assume that the floor of the car is frictionless. You're gonna slide back to the you know the end of the car when it when it starts moving. So from your perspective th this is what happens. You know, you're just standing there, and then you start moving backwards. Even though there was no net external force on you, you started moving backwards. So from your perspective, Newton's first law was just violated. So that means inside of the car is not an initial reference frame. However, if someone is standing outside of the car and looking at you, then all they would see is that you just stood still while the car started moving out from under you. So from their perspective, you didn't actually slide backwards, you just stood in the same place, which is consistent with Newton's first law. So the person looking outside is in an initial reference frame. So in general, we say that the surface of the Earth is in an initial reference frame, even though it's not exactly because, you know, the Earth is always rotating. So most of the time, an initial reference frame is one that is not accelerating or rotating. So, you know, this car, once it started accelerating, it became a non-initial reference frame. So initial reference frames are usually standing still or moving at a constant velocity. So lastly, we can look at one example of you know, Newton's first law. So say we have a block sitting on a table and it's attached to some strings. So one force, or you could say it's a, it's a tension force because it's exerted by a string. So one force is 40 Newtons from a 40 degree angle to the right, and then we have a 30 Newton force directly to the left. So the question is, where does a third force need to be in order for the net external force to be zero? You know, for example, say we know that the block is not moving, that means the net external force is zero. So we want to find where is the third force. So the easiest way to do this is split up the forces into the x and y components. So choosing uh, choosing right to be the positive direction and left to be negative, we can find that the horizontal component of that 40 Newton force 
is going to be 40 times the cosine of 40 degrees. So the net force in the x direction is 40 times cosine 40 minus 30. And then in the y direction, only the 40 only the 40 Newton force contributes. So that's going to be 40 times the sine of 40 degrees in the y direction. So using a calculator to you know, get those values, then we can see exactly what the third force needs to be in order to cancel both the x and y components out. So it just has to be the opposite of the net x and y forces, because if you added that third force to the other two, then the x and y components would both be zero. And so the net external force is zero on the object.